Hold on, we're trying to set up the audio over here. Again, thank you everybody. We're set up, we're setting up a new machine uh, with a little more power to get us through the remainder of the evening. Jeff Fritz is doing an amazing job being the AV guy. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jamie. We have Jamie Singleton also being my co-host, or we're, we're our, not co-host, we are the hosts. We are the hosts together. That's right. So we're trying to figure this out. And we have, as you can see, we have David already ready to go. We obviously just, he, you can't hear him. <laughs> you got his desktop sharing, so. We're just figuring out the audio pieces and we should be ready to get rock and roll. So the mics are on in here in the studio. Yeah, the mics are on. We're just the rain, live in the studio. That's though. right. The <laughs> rain in Spain falls mainly in the plane. <laughs> Does that sound good for everybody? I know I, I could do uh, I can do a couple jokes. Jeff is up very late right tonight. Jeff yes. is a rock star. Jeff he is needs a to machine. be sleeping right now. But so hey, so all of us. all of you who are watching right now, or at least hearing us right now, <laughs> uh, you guys need to check out Jeff's show. He broadcasts through the Visual Studio channel as well. Dad jokes. Oh, we can do some dad jokes too. That's awesome. You know the best part about UDP jokes is I don't care if you get them or not. <laughs> Doom, boom. Come on, at least there's one of you geeks out there that found that amusing. WP. There we go. Thank you, King Demo. There. Let's see. How many there speakers? There we go. Ha! <laughs> ah, that's funny. That fell into a static void. Boom, boom. <laughs> the device isn't used by another application. Does that mean it is it? We can see the slide deck now over here. I don't know. We're gonna try this out. Hey, there it is. You guys can see my Skype now. Oh, the, the, uh, the answer uh, for Clark IO or Clarkio, it is always spaces. Unless you set your tabs to be always four spaces, <laughs> then that's okay too. So the questions here is, is do we do K and R? Because that's the only way to really code. <laughs> Elgato's scream of death is the best scream of death. I love that. Should we just go to the other machine, you think? Or yeah, at this point, let's go back. Okay. Yeah, might as well go back. We are going to punt to the other machine. We don't know what's going on. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, sorry about that, everybody, uh, but I think we're we're alive now. Um, hi, my name's David Garden. I'm a uh, .NET developer based in Adelaide, South Australia. So uh, there is an Australian accent. Um, do sort of call me up if there's anything I say that you don't understand. Um, my talk today is on um, packaging and projects and the new project system um, and how we can use that even if you're using .NET Framework projects. Um, so uh, this is all um, related to the um, a new project system uh, that first uh, shipped with .NET Core. And if we jump over to um, the right browser window, um, so this is based on GitHub. It's an open source project. And um, 
you can see it's quite an active project. There's stuff happening there all the time. The new project system uh, was created uh, really because the old project system, which was written for sort of C-sharp and Visual Basic projects, was really tied to Visual Studio. So we're only going to work on Windows. So for cross-platform support, um, they needed to come up with something new. And it's also given them an opportunity to, to sort of rethink how it's all implemented, make some performance improvements. So do have a look at the, the GitHub site. There's some good documentation on here on what really makes up the project system. And also uh, things like a feature comparison, what what things are in the new project system that aren't in the old one, and vice versa, what hasn't been brought into the new one yet. And uh, and also, yeah, just get an idea of what releases are going to have those features as well. It is open source, so you can even jump in and add some um, uh, requests for features and maybe even commit a pull request as well. So the new project system, well, let's have a look and see how we can actually migrate an existing project to use that. I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio. So I've got a solution opened here. It's actually um, the source code for Chocolatey's choco.exe command line tool. So Chocolatey is a, a platform for installing software on a Windows PC. It's a bit like apt-get for Linux, uh, but on the Windows platform. Um, and so I've downloaded the source code for their command line tool. And I'm going to demonstrate upgrading the Chocolatey class library to using the new project system format. Um, the first thing we can do, and I'll just switch over to VS Code just to show you what that looks like. Uh, I've got so many windows here. Uh, where are we? Whoop, sorry. Um, so here's the project file for Chocolate at the moment. If you've ever looked at a CS proj or a VB proj, it'll look pretty familiar. We've got things like uh, assembly references, uh, we've got every source file is listed there individually um, that's part of this particular library. We've got other things like embedded resources and uh, project references and a few other bits and pieces as well. So that whole file there is around about 371 lines long. Okay, move that one out of the way. So the first thing we can do is uh, just a small thing. We've got NuGet package references here. And uh, so one thing we can do is actually migrate those to use the new package reference format. And one way we can do that is to use a little wizard that should normally pop up here in this menu when I right click on the references node. If it doesn't, then just open up your package manager console window. And by allowing that to happen, then that menu item will appear. So just if you don't see it, you just need to do that step first just to initialize it. We then see uh, all the, the current list of packages that we're using in this project. We'll also see a couple here that have been put under the transitive dependencies um, section. And what that means is that these two packages, we're currently referencing those, but we don't need to um, going forwards because they're actually dependencies of RxLink and so we don't need to directly depend on these. Uh, Rx link is going to bring them in for us. You can choose to still depend on them if you want, but we don't need to. So I'm going to hit OK. It's going to uninstall those packages from packages.config, and it's going to bring up a little log file to say what it's done. I'll close that and close this file, which I think was to do with uninstalling the packages. And so now I'll hit Save. And so our project's still there. I'll switch back to VS Code. Too many things open. Uh, where's it gone? There it is. Oh, sorry. And we'll see down the bottom of the file here, we now have a new item group there with package reference. So I still haven't converted the rest of the project, but we can already start using package reference here rather than packages.config. And so we're already making use of the transient dependency. So we only need to reference Rx link in this case, and we're getting those other two packages in. So our, our line count is down a little bit. I'm just going to copy um, that into my clipboard because we're going to use that in a second. And back to the project now. So we've done that. Uh, let's keep going. And I'm just going to jump over. And the next thing we do is actually convert the um, project itself to the new format. And one easy way of doing that is to use a command line tool. So 
Uh, and we can use .NET, the command line tool, uh, to create a new project file. So I'm going to .NET new class lib, and the name is going to be chocolatey. If I hit enter on that, it's actually going to complain and say, hang on, that file already exists. Are you sure? And I'll say, yes, I am. So I'll run that. And that's created a new project file. I switch back to VS Code, and we'll see that now our project file is really small. Uh, that's fantastic. Possibly even a little bit too small. By default, it sets the target framework as, as net standard 2.0, but our project was actually targeting .NET 4.0, so I'll change the target back because uh, we're not ready to migrate our code base to .NET standard yet. I can paste back in my package references uh, because they're going to work as well. Now I switch back to Visual Studio and you'll notice, yep, that project's changed. I need to reload it. And here we go. And it looks pretty much the same. Um, so we've still got all our source code files there. And now I can right click on my project and I can edit the project without having to unload it. So that is a great feature of the new project system. We don't have to unload, edit, reload and wait forever. We can edit the project file live. That's fantastic. We've got all our project references there. So if I expand this new dependencies node here, I can see my new get packages there all nicely. And we can even see those transitive dependencies. There's those other two packages underneath RxLink. That's looking good. So what else do we need to do? Um, so normally you'd probably use your version control and do a diff between the old project and the new project to, um, to figure out what things you do need to bring back in here. So I've got my package references done. I also have some regular assembly references. Some of these are to framework assemblies and some of those are to other libraries that are in my source code repository. So I'll bring those in and just hit save. And then the other thing I need is uh, at the moment, you'll notice we've got all the files uh, are included in the project. We don't need to list them anymore because by default, the new project system includes every file that's under the directory of that project file. But in this case, the old project was also linking to a file outside of that directory hierarchy. So I do need to bring that in. And so that was this file here. The other thing you'll notice is we've actually got a new file here. So when I created that project file, it also created a um, just a, a placeholder class file. I'm going to delete that. And one thing to uh, keep in mind is that because the project system now is including every file by default, that means if you had any files in your old project that were on in sort of version control or on the disk, but uh, not in the project, so you would excluded those from the project, they're going to suddenly reappear in the project. So it may be that before you do this kind of migration, you clean up all those files first just to avoid um, any problems with them sort of reappearing in the project. Okay, so we've got our um, solution file there. Um, the, and so one more thing we need to do, a couple more things, is we need to um, add a project reference back uh, that was in the old project. So I can just go in here and use the GUI for that one. And we'll see that's just added a project reference element there. The other thing we had, if, if you remember quickly, when I looked at the original project file, there was some embedded resources there. So I better put them back in because by default, um, uh, files that are not source code files, for example, this config file, have a build action of none. So uh, I'll change that to embedded resource and hit save, and we'll just jump back to the project file and see what happened there. So by default, uh, any other file is added to the none item group. And so by changing that to embedded resource, it's added this line here, which is we're gonna remove that file from the none group. And then down the bottom, it's gonna add that file into the embedded resource group like that. I've got a few other files I need to do the same for that. So I'll just find those, and they're under here. So again, I could just uh, use a diff tool and just sort of copy those over from the old version if I knew um, which ones needed to go over there. I'll change them to embedded resource. Okay, that should be pretty much it. Let's try and build this project and see how we go. And we got an error. Okay, so what was our error? 
I'll bring up the error list so we can see it there as well. It's complaining that we've got a duplicate of all these attributes. So what's going on there? Uh, I'm just going to grab that out of there. So it turns out the new project system um, has uh, some nice features. So let's just find where those attributes are declared at the moment. So normally you would often declare those attributes in your assembly info file. If I open that, actually there's no attributes declared there, but there was that linked file that I added in. Let's have a look at that one. And sure enough, yes, that's where they're being declared, but they're only declared once. So where's this duplicate coming from? Well, the new project system actually generates these for you. You don't need to define them yourself if you don't want to. Um, however, in this case, I've already got them here. Um, I don't want the project system to do that. So how do I turn that off? Well, you can just set a property in your project file. So I'll come back up here and set that to false. And if I build my project now, let's see, yep, that error is gone. So that's good. Uh, so we just said add the same properties for all the other attributes because we've got them already there, drop them in. And now if I build, all good. And so, in fact, if I build the solution and jump back to my PowerShell window, I think I might even be able to run the console application. So, uh, in debug choco, see if that works. And it does. So, there you go. We've managed to migrate one of our projects in this solution to the new format. Uh, we'll switch back and Actually, we don't need to do that. Um, so we're now down to about 75 lines from about 360, I think it was before. So our project file is a lot more compact. And the nice thing is because we're not including every source file in this project, it means that if you're adding new files or removing them, you're not going to be modifying this file. So just one less thing to worry about merge conflicts. Okay. While we're here, we, we added some package references in there. There's some other nice things we can do with package references. One of the things is we can um, use floating version numbers. So you might uh, think, well, actually, I'm happy to take uh, whatever is the latest version of RxLink, uh, 2.1 dot, the highest number that's out now. Or you might be really brave and go, yep, whatever version 2 is, I want, I want that one, and I want the latest one of that. And actually, if we hit Save on that, We'll notice that the, the build system goes away, thinks for a bit, and then realizes actually the latest one is 2.2.5, so it's able to, to load that in pretty quickly. That, that's even quicker because I've already done this before, so things are cached on my computer. Um, we're looking at this and we're thinking, that's good, um, and it's nice how uh, we've got our version numbers here, but if I've got a solution with a lot of projects and I want to upgrade a package, that's still going to impact a whole lot of projects with changing all the version numbers. So wouldn't it be nice if I could centralize uh, how I'm versioning all my packages? Well, yes, it would. So let's jump back to VS Code. And I'm going to create a new file here under my solution. And I'm going to call that file directory.build.targets. And this is an MS build file, so I'm going to make the root element project. I'm just going to paste in item group that is copied out of my other project. And I'm just going to change where it says include. I'm going to change that to update. And hit save. And by doing this, that file is now picked up by the, the project system. And it means I don't need to specify my versions here anymore. And in fact, I could go through and delete all of those. And I'll do that. I'll actually get rid of that one and I'll bring in a new one, which is a little bit more succinct. So now uh, we can see that, in fact, the version numbers are still getting picked up in, in Visual Studio here. Uh, it, it's loading that directory.build.targets file and including that with each project file under the solution. Um, so you can also have a directory.build.props file, which is sort of prepended to each project, and the targets file is sort of appended 
to each project. And the syntax there, I'll, I'll switch back to that file, really is that rather than include, we've got an update. So this is going to find any uh, items in the package reference item group with this name, and it's going to set the uh, version metadata to 2.1.3. And so that's how we're able to still have these version numbers here. So now with that one file, I can centralize all the version numbers for my packages. One thing to be aware of with that though is uh, it's very convenient for managing versions. The, the tooling in Visual Studio, I can still go in and say manage NuGet packages to, to see if there's updates. But if I try and apply those updates, it doesn't know how to update directory.build.targets. So you'll, you'll still want to go in and manually update um, those, that file if you want to do a package update. Um, okay, moving on. Um, Another thing with our, our project file while we're up here is the um, SDK attribute. This is a new addition to the, the project file format. And you'll notice that uh, we have Microsoft.net.sdk there. So that's the sort of default value that was created for us. If you create a unit test project, it'll have a slightly different name there. But the interesting thing is that this name, we can put other values in there. And so for one example of that, I'll switch over to my browser. And so an, another developer quite well known in the .NET community, Oren Novotny, has created um, a package called msbuild.sdk.extras. And so this is a NuGet package. And if you use that name with that SDK attribute, then you it will download this package and it will add some extra functionality that, that Oren's implemented. So in this case, this package does um, uh, generate reference assemblies. So if you're creating sort of class libraries, are they going to be people going to be using that may be something of interest. But also just to see how Oren has managed to to extend um, the project system with a custom SDK. Cool. All right. Um, so we've seen how to generate um, a and and migrate a project. And that's all worked really well. I'm now going to show you a few little areas where in me doing this, um, I've encountered some some differences in how the old project system and new project system work. So the first one of those is um, looking at um, generating files as part of the build process and, and how they're included. Um, so this is something I've seen in a, in a couple of different places where you have a project or a, a solution where the app.config file is not committed to version control. Um, and so essentially because every developer has their own connection string and their own preference for logging. And so to avoid everybody fighting over and overriding everyone else's config, we don't commit the app config. Don't know why I keep doing that. Um, we commit another file and in the project file we have a build step that just checks to see if there's no app config then I'm going to copy the app default config to app config. If there is one I'll just leave it alone. So that allows the developers to have their own customized settings in this file um, and sort of work and everyone's happy. Uh, one thing I did notice though is if I open this folder here and we look in the, the build output folder is there's an exe and a pdb, but there's no exe.config file there. Now, if I built this project again, then it would create one, but the first time it didn't. So if I delete that app config and do a build, we'll see that, yep, there's still no config file there. So how can we make sure that that first time around that the, the config gets copied out correctly? Um, so what I discovered was, it's presumably it's just a slight change in the sequence in which things happen in the new project system. I just need to include this line here to say that when we do do a copy, we just update the none group with that file and then the build system is able to pick that up later on and generate that. So I'll the file again. We'll build our project again. And we've got our config file back, so that's good. So that's just one little thing that I needed to do just to, to make things work properly. Particularly, you, you might want to use this because um, even that, that first time is something that would probably happen on a build server, so something to be aware of. 
Okay. Uh, the other thing uh, that I noticed is that, uh, and you may have noticed this too already, is that the output path for new project system projects is slightly different. So um, I've got two console applications here. I'll run the first one. It's a very simple application. It just uh, looks for a file, loads that file, and just outputs some content from that file, which happens to be the program.cs file. So not that exciting. Uh, that's using the old project system, the same application migrated to the new project system. We'll run that one and we actually get an exception. It failed. It couldn't find the file to open it. And the reason is that under the new project system, it's not just bin slash debug. It's bin debug and also by default the, um, the target framework name. So there's our XE there. And for most of the time, that's that's quite reasonable. And one advantage of that is actually um, it. one of the reasons that they did that was because you can target multiple frameworks. So I can go in here and I can say, actually, I want to target .NET 4.5 and .NET 4. Whoop, not 7.5, 4.7. Um, and so it needs two different directories to output those two. Um, but if you're migrating a sort of a legacy application, I've seen this in some unit test um, libraries that uh, I've worked on, where they're loading data files from the project itself. And so one way to, to go back to the old way of uh, output path is to set this property here, append target framework to output path, set that to false, and then things should work. So if I rebuild that application and press F5, everything works again. So normally you wouldn't do that, but just in rather than having to update all the logic in this um, application straight away, I can set that and then sort of move on. Then I can come back and make that and that sort of update the code later on if I want to. Okay. Um, all right, we've seen a couple of things uh, with sort of uh, dealing with um, sort of differences in the, the project system. Uh, we're now going to move on to NuGet packages, sort of both consuming them and creating them. So in this example here, um, we've got some NuGet packages. So two class libraries that I'm going to that are creating NuGet packages, and I've got two console applications that are consuming those NuGet packages. So I'm not using project references. I'm using package references here. Um, the old ones are using the old project system. The new projects or uh, the not old ones are using the new project system. Uh, and so here, I've got my old class library. I've got a, um, a text file there, and that's being added in as content in that NuGet package. And in the old application, sure enough, the package, that file from that package has been included in this project, and it is there under the project file. Um, however, the new uh, project system project is also referencing that package, but it doesn't have a text file one there. Um, the reason is that uh, there's been a change with the with using package references that any content in a as in files that are using the content target are not uh, included in a new project system project. So they anything like that needs to be updated to use content files target. And so the example in this project, I'll open up uh, the project file, is that we've got our text file new here. So it's not only going in content, so we can still work with older projects, but any new project system needs to be under content files. Um, and this also shows that we can generate a new get package from the project file, and we don't need to have a separate new spec file. So we have our generate package on build property set to true. So every time we build this library, it's also going to create a NuGet package. Uh, if you can't remember what that setting is, then just open up the project properties and you'll see there's a package tab here. And that corresponds to this option, the generate NuGet package on build. There's also all these other fields that you can fill in that are all the, 
the values that are the metadata that's going to be added to the the package as well. Um, so you can fill all those in, so that you don't need to have a new spec file necessarily uh, to generate a new get package, which is a, another nice optimization, one less thing to worry about. So if I uh, using that package and I'm using it in a project that's also using the new project system, we'll see that this text file new, we've sort of said that that should appear under the special directory. So in this project here, sure enough, there's our special directory and there's our text file new. Now, one other thing to be aware of, if we hover down here, it doesn't quite show up. So I'll just select that value. This is the path to where that actual file is. It's not located under our project anymore. It's actually located under my user profile. So be aware of that, that uh, the new product system, package references, the packages are unpacked in this directory under the user's profile, be that the, the developer or the, the account that your build server is running at. So that means, again, if you've got code that's making assumptions about where these files end up, uh, you're going to have to change that code. And so again, I've encountered this where uh, was using NuGet packages to, to wrap um, backpack database files for use with uh, integration tests. And so I had to change those packages to be able to find where those files were so that we could run those against the database. All right, moving on. Uh, another scenario, I've got a, um, a solution here and I've got a class library that I'm creating a, a NuGet package for because this class library has some fantastic business logic in it. And I'm pretty sure that this business logic is so good because it's it's bug free. I'm, I'm pretty confident of that. And I'm sure the other developers uh, in my company are going to want to use this because they love bug free code. Um, but I'm also using this as a project reference for this tool uh, that I've got here that's uh, um, doing some fantastic stuff. And uh, so this is a, a NuGet package tool. So I'll show you in the project file, I'm using is tool equals true. I want to package this up and distribute it as a NuGet package, but it's an XE. And uh, so if I do that, I'll, I'll do build and I'll show you there's some problems here that if I go to File Explorer, we'll open up that package using the NuGet Package Explorer. Okay, so it's a tool project, so it's going to put things under the tools directory, but we've only got the XE. We don't have the, the linked assembly that we're also depending on with that fantastic business logic in it. We've also um, added a dependency here. We're depending on this other package, but we're a tool package. We don't want that. Uh, we should all be self-contained. So how can we fix that? So let's go back here. And first of all, to um, bring in that ref that project reference, we need to hook into the, the build process here. So I'm just going to uncomment this line, which allows us to hook this extra build target in. And this build target just goes through any project references and makes sure that we're copying any of those project references to our package output. The second thing I want to do is remove that package dependency because we, we don't want that for a tool package. So there's a private assets property that I can set for the project reference. And I'm going to set that to all. What that does is it means that as far as NuGet goes, this reference, I'm using it, but no one else needs to know about it. You can also see this through the GUI if you expand dependencies and projects. And down here in the properties, you'll also see private assets, uh, include assets. Um, so if I hit save, then we should see that down there. Um, okay, if I hit run, I'm going to rebuild everything. And just for luck, I'm going to do it again. If I go back, open up that package again, I'm hoping that now I don't have any other dependencies and in my tools, I've got both my assembly and the XE. So that's what I want. That's good. Okay, moving on. Okay, different scenario now. Um, we've got our NuGet package and 
my developers that are using my package, they'd like to have a better experience using that package as far as um, if something goes wrong, it would be nice if they had uh, the PDBs. And previously, you would have said, David, don't include PDBs in the NuGet package because they're so massive and they just make it so big. But we now have portable PDBs and a portable PDB is a lot smaller. So it is conceivable to include that in the package itself. And I'll show you what I mean. In this example here, I've got a library and the library itself is 4K and the PDB is only 1K. So rather than the, the, the debugging symbols, the PDB files being much larger than the, the, the output assemblies, they're actually generally a lot smaller now. So adding that to a NuGet package is no big drama. Um, so we can do that and so if we edit our class library, we just need to change a property here to say I don't just want to include the DLL, I also want to include the .pdb as well. And I'll just increment my version number for the package as well so that we can do that. I'm going to rebuild, I'm just going to rebuild that package. And then we'll switch back to here. And so I've now got, there's my package. I'll just open that up just to show you that we do actually have both the DLL and the PDB there, that's good. And now, just to, to also prove that I've got nothing up my sleeve, I'm just going to delete that directory. I'm going to come back down here. I'm going to delete object and the C sharp, the source code for that as well. I'm going to come back to the project. I'm going to remove that library from the solution. And now, having done that, I'm going to upgrade these two projects because these have package references to that package. I'm going to upgrade those and I've just configured it to look in that directory. So the upgrade's gone ahead. That's all good. Uh, I'm now just going to rebuild everything here. And we'll see how, uh, um, now that we've got that PDB inside the package, we'll see what the experience is of a, a developer trying to sort of use a, a runner program, a debugger program that's using that package. So here we go. Uh, so I, there is a problem. It is going to throw an exception. That's expected. However, if we look down here, and I'll sort of zoom in a bit for that, um, there is, it doesn't, it doesn't know what the language was, and it doesn't have the line number. So where is that? What's going on? Well, it turns out that there, there is this little bit of an issue with um, .NET framework projects uh, that have portable PDBs in a NuGet package. Um, it's not copying the PDB from the NuGet package output to the program output. So then it doesn't find a PDB. So how can we solve that? Um, if we have a look at this other project here, uh, we can solve that by adding another package reference. So, um, so people have figured out that uh, there's some extra build steps we can add in that will will do that copying. So if we add the reference to this NuGet package, source link .copy .pdb files, and we debug this one. So the only difference is adding, including that extra um, package reference, which just changes our build process. If we debug this, we'll still get the exception, but we do get the line numbers. So at least we know what line that exception was being thrown on. So that's a bit better experience. So so that's all good. Um, okay, so our developers are happy with that. Um, the other thing we could do, if I stop debugging this, is even add... Um, support for source link. So what that will do is allow consumers of our package to actually step into the source code for the assembly that they're debugging from our package. So I've already unloaded the, the class library that we were using here. So rather than trying to bring that back, let's just imagine that this project was uh, also being packed in a NuGet package. Um, so all we need to do to make this um, include information for source link is add in one extra line here. And that is another package reference. And so depending on what kind of source control you're using, so uh, or what source control provider, uh, there's different packages to help out with this. So in this case, if I was using uh, VSTS, or as it's now known, Azure DevOps, uh, with Git, I could use that one. Or if I was using GitHub, 
I would use that package. And what it does is by including this package, it updates the PDB to include some extra data that the debugger can then read and know where the source code is for this particular package. So what does that look like? Well, let's see an example. I'll jump over and bring up uh, a project. So what I've got here is an ASP.NET Core web application. And I didn't want to do that. Um, and the nice thing about all the latest ASP.NET Core uh, projects is they they all they bring in all their functionality through NuGet packages that support source link. So if I press F9 there to set a breakpoint, I'm going to hit F5 to launch our application under the debugger. And so there goes our web page, and we've got our breakpoint here. And so then if I've got all the everything set up correctly, I can press F11 to step into, and now I'm stepping into the source code for ASP.NET Core. And so you can see there, the path of that file is some path somewhere on my computer. It's it's already been downloaded. The first time you do this, it will take a little while to go and, and download those files. I've already done that before, so it was pretty quick the second time around. Um, but I can step through, I can press F10 or F11 and step over and step into and jump through all that code. So if I'm trying to debug a problem and I don't understand what's happening behind the wrappers, then I can can use that source link to step into the original source code. So that's a pretty cool experience. And just press F5 to finish that. Cool. Yes. Yes. Well, I can I can do. I can do better than that. I've... Well, don't panic. Yeah, no, it's all good because that was my final demo. And so just wrapping up. <laughs> so it's all good. Um, so yeah, just wrapping up. Uh, just to keep things on time. Uh, so I just showed you the new product system and how we can really reduce the size of our projects and reduce the amount of change we need in those, particularly with package references. We can centralize version numbers in directory build targets. Uh, there's little sort of differences in dealing with generated files and the output paths. Uh, we can generate NuGet packages directly from our project files um, and include PDBs, portable PDBs, in our NuGet packages and even add source link um, and uh, yeah, give the consumers of our packages a really great experience. So all the demos I've given today are up on GitHub in a repo and that's it there. And I've tried to include links to further resources and also links to the original sources for a lot of those tips because don't be under the impression that I'm that clever. Um, I just know how to, to search for stuff. So when I encounter problems, often I found someone else that already um, figured out the solution. So um, some good resources there. And I'm done. So uh, thanks for everyone for your attention. And yes, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take those. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, no. Bye.